South Carolina hangs with the dogs for a half, but eventually the Bulldogs pull away between the hedges to take another victory in the SEC, running their streak to perfection on the way to the college football playoff as they beat South Carolina 24-10. How can South Carolina get back to their winning ways and try to put the final nail in the coffin with the Florida Gators? The South Carolina men's basketball team did not fare all, this, all that well over the weekend. Also, with their hoot for hurricane relief, we'll talk to you about that exhibition game against Virginia Tech, update you with the score, and look ahead to the regular season for men's basketball. Take a ride around the SEC as well. A lot to get to on the program. Let's get started right here on the Carolina Crow Line. Follow the show on Twitter at Carolina Crow Line. Email the show at gcsportstalk at gmail.com. Check out the Groupon app where you can save up to infinity, theoretically speaking. Actually, you can save up to $100 a week on what you do every day. Suppose you saved $10 on tacos and took that $10 and used it to get more great restaurant deals on Groupon, like Italian or Chinese. Pretty soon, you could save a ton. Brunch? Check Groupon. Dinner plans? Check Groupon. Hungry? Use the top-rated Groupon app to save up to $100 a week on what you do every day. Download the app and save. Groupon. Men, if you're like me, you appreciate the feeling of a clean, smooth shave from a quality blade. The sort of shave that cuts clean without the burn. So why are you messing around with generic razors that cost 32 bucks for an 8-pack when you can shave with Harry's high-quality German-engineered blades for half the price? And because Harry's is so confident in the quality of their blades, they'll send you their most popular set, complete with a razor, one of their world-famous blades, shaving cream, and post-shave balm for free if you cover shipping. A total value of $20 at no cost to you with code 0404 at checkout. Their way of saying thank you for trying them. How is Harry's able to save you all this money and still give you the best shave you'll ever enjoy? By owning the factory that manufactures the blades. That's how. Go to harrys.com now and enter code 0404 at checkout to claim your free trial set and post-shave balm. That's harrys.com, code 0404. What makes a holiday card unforgettable? Personality. And no one makes it easier or more affordable to create a holiday card full of personality than Vistaprint. Right now, get 50% off all custom holiday cards. That means 30 cards start at less than $15. With hundreds of stunning designs, your personality will shine through with every card you send. Just go to Vistaprint.com today and enter the promo code HOLIDAY to get 50% off all custom holiday cards. That's Vistaprint.com, promo code HOLIDAY. What's up, Gamecock fans? This is the Carolina Crow Line here on the CRM Sports Studios. I'm your host of the show, Tyler Garrett. We're just getting things started off. South Carolina falling between the hedges 24-10 to in a game that had some trickeration early. It, it looked like Kirby Smart was ready to get uh, one quickly on the scoreboard with the opening kick being an onside kick. So right there from the get-go, South Carolina gets an opportunity to get nice field position and actually turn the tables very quickly on the Bulldogs there at home, but they weren't able to get anything going. Georgia drives down the field. You get that fumble. You come back down the field. You miss a field goal, and it just seemed like we talked early last week. One of the keys to the game for me was South Carolina getting on the board early and taking advantage of every opportunity they could get. If they could get a turnover, they have to be able to convert on those, and South Carolina just wasn't able to do that early. They wound up tying it up 7-7. I believe it was, on Brian Edwards' amazing catch in the end zone. But you just had the sense that after a while, Georgia was going to start to pull away. And, and in the second half, that's basically what began to happen. It was just too much for South Carolina. They had their opportunities, and, but it just seemed like offensively, they were never quite in the best position to take advantage of their opportunities. Jake Bentley gets um, the arm hit there right the last play right before halftime when South Carolina has the ball. It would have been a wide open pass to Brian Edwards deep down the middle of the field. He gets his arm hit. He winds up just tossing a wounded duck straight up in the middle of the air. That's get, that gets picked, and it was just that kind of game. It seemed like South Carolina was on the verge to make something happen, but they couldn't quite just kick the door down and really put Georgia in a situation where they had to make plays when it counted. And Georgia, again, we knew – 
what they like to do offensively. They like to run the football, and there was going to be no secret how the game was going to play out. Although early in the football game, it seemed like Kirby Smart really wanted to establish Jake Fromm and his ability to get the defensive backs moved out of the box because you could tell South Carolina was stacking the box early and Georgia's game plan was going to be to try and loosen the box a little bit, get some of those defenders out of there to establish a running game later on in the football game. And that didn't really happen. South Carolina was like, you know what, you can throw all you want. And they were perfectly happy playing eight yards off the receivers and they were going to give them little out routes and little hitches and things like that all game long. And that's fine until you get down to about, about the 15-yard line, and then Jake Fromm just starts dropping dimes straight into the end zone. So that wasn't going to be a recipe for success. So second half, you come out, Georgia really starts to establish that running game. And, and these guys are just guys you cannot bring down with ankle tackles. And there were many times where South Carolina defenders were in position to stop a play either behind the line of scrimmage or at the line of scrimmage, but just couldn't seem to bring – the the running backs down. I would say this is probably th that was probably one of South Carolina's worst tackling performances on the season. And just to kind of give you a heads up with the stats, defensively speaking, South Carolina came away with four tackles for loss and a sack on the game. Georgia only had five tackles for loss and two sacks on the game, despite the fact that they didn't allow South Carolina to do anything on the ground. South Carolina only 17 carries for 43 yards completely a one-dimensional offense, but at the same time, South Carolina experienced success throwing the football. I thought it was actually a pretty well-played, well-called football game from an offensive standpoint for Kurt Roper throwing the football. I thought Jake Bentley had a pretty doggone good game as well, 21 of 35 for 227 yards and a touchdown. Of course, he had the two picks, one towards the end of the ball game where he was just trying to hope for something to happen and then that batted ball right there before halftime. But uh, when you give up 242 yards on the ground for Georgia, that's not going to be a recipe for success for South Carolina. And I believe South Carolina, actually I had to go back and double check, but South Carolina held Georgia below their average for rushing yards per game. I believe Georgia is averaging 280 yards on the ground per contest. So you hold Georgia to below their average, but still 242 yards, if you give up that kind of yardage, it's not you're not going to win many of those football games. And just to give you an idea, to hit you with some more stats, uh, Georgia 438 total yards for the contest. South Carolina only with 270, and 227 of those 270 came throwing the football, so nothing doing with the running game. I actually thought that after we saw the success that Jake Bentley had on the zone read with the quarterback keep last weekend, or excuse me, the weekend prior, I guess I should say, against Vanderbilt, I thought they were showing that a week early for the Georgia Bulldogs to stand up and take note of that, something else to game plan for, something else to spread the defense out and create those one-on-one -on -one matchups. They did not work the quarterback keep um, against the, the Georgia Bulldogs at all. They tried to run between the tackles a lot against the Georgia Bulldogs, which hasn't, hasn't really been successful for anybody at all this season. You had a couple of outside runs, but overall those were basically stopped, and it was going to be up to Jake Bentley to throw South Carolina to a victory, and it just wasn't, just wasn't going to happen. So 24-10 what was the score? I actually predicted here on the Crow line it was going to be more like a 38-21 football game. So they had their opportunities. They were within striking distance for the majority of the ball game. But when you got deep into the third quarter and fourth quarter, you just got the sense that it just wasn't going to happen for South Carolina. Even when they got really good foot, uh, field position, it just didn't seem like they had enough. When South Carolina was able to drive the football for scores, they converted on third down. And again, this it's an oversimplification to say, well, if you can't convert on third down, you can't win football games. I think even the most casual football fan knows that. But if you cannot consistently perform on third down, you're going to have a hard time winning important big-time ball games in the SEC. South Carolina only 4 of 12 on third down against the Bulldogs. Conversely, Georgia 8 of 13, over 50% on third down. And a lot of that was throwing the football when you had the, the defensive backs playing off and allowing Jake Fromm to complete those short outside throws, they just marched methodically 
down the field, and that's exactly what they did in the third quarter coming out in the second half. Georgia took about six, six, excuse me, six minutes. There we go. That's, that sounds like a number I know. Six minutes off the clock uh, in the third quarter, and, and <laughs> that, was, that was the game plan. Once you establish that lead, drain that clock and don't give the opponent the opportunity to crawl their way back into the football game. And that's a lot like what Will Muschamp and Kurt Roper have tried to do this season when they've established a lead, just like what they did against Vanderbilt. And Vanderbilt was almost able to come back and win that football game. Nobody was picking South Carolina to win this football game. Vegas had them at a 23-point at a spread. I thought South Carolina did a very good job uh, hanging with the Bulldogs for as long as they could. Last week on the program, we talked about this was going to be one of those measuring stick type of games for South Carolina to see where they actually fall in the pecking order of the SEC East. And right now, coming off of that performance, I would have to say the outlook is pretty optimistic for South Carolina football moving forward. At, at this point in the season, overall, in terms of long-term success, I think Georgia and South Carolina are really the only teams in the SEC East that are trending in the upward direction for the rest of 2017 and beyond 2018 and 2019 into the future. I, I think you can start to maybe put Missouri in that category a little bit, but they like to beat up on a lot of, of little teams when it comes to the SEC play. They're still not there yet. Kentucky, they're just kind of, they seem like that 500 team that they're going to be right in the middle. They, I, don't, would, I wouldn't call them trending up or down necessarily. I, I think they're just kind of hovering uh, around the middle of the pack in the SEC East. So right now, the way I see it, You've got the Gamecocks and you've got Georgia who are going to be vying for the top spot in the SEC East, I think, for the next two to three years. So South Carolina didn't get blown out. They had their opportunities, and they did hold Georgia and limit what they were able to do offensively in spots. The problem was South Carolina wasn't able to sustain success offensively, and they weren't going to be able to stop UGA long-term over the course of the football game, and that led to a 24-10 loss. We're Head out to our first break. Stay with us. A lot more to cover right here on the Carolina Crow Line. All right, we're back here on the program looking back on the Gamecocks lost 24 to 10 between the hedges down there in Athens. Your halftime stats, just to kind of give you an idea of what was going on at halftime, Georgia had 16 first downs by halftime. It was 14-7 at halftime. Georgia had already had 16 first downs, four of six on third down, and that was part of the problem for South Carolina again. This is kind of a stretch, and I don't know how, how many of you in Gamecock Nation can think back, but a game like this, really, and, and the score-wise, there's not really a connection. But performance-wise, this reminded me, I always think back to the 2010 SEC Championship game when South Carolina was playing Cam Newton and the Auburn Tigers. South Carolina had early down success stopping Cam Newton and the Auburn Tigers. But they continually lived in third and four third and five, third and three against the Auburn Tigers in Atlanta. And you're not going to stop. You, South Carolina just had no answer for Cam Newton and Gus Malzahn in that running game. And, and they couldn't stop him on third down all game long. And that's what allowed Auburn just to go up and down the field on South Carolina in that championship game. I was watching the game on Saturday, and they kind of had that feel. You, you, you stop them for no gain on first down. You might let them get 
three or four yards on second down. You've got them on third and six, third and five, third and medium. And then you just let them convert time after time after time. So it kind of had that feel to me. Georgia had 124 yards on the ground at halftime, 126 yards passing, 250 total yards by halftime for the Bulldogs. Now, the score didn't reflect it. They weren't able to get it into the end zone. You had that turnover by the Bulldogs right there on the doorstep going into score. That was one of the reasons why the score d looked the way it did. Georgia potentially could have been going in 21-7 at halftime, and it, things really could have gotten out of hand there. But at halftime, Bentley 11 for 17 for 139 yards, uh, two sacks in the first half. And then you had 19 total yards rushing in the first half. I mean, some the running game has got to improve. I don't think you'll find a Gamecock fan that is going to tell you that uh, no, we're good with the running game the way it is. Um, one thing I did really love uh, was how Jake Bentley was able to spread the ball around and find success with the, whatever playmakers they've got left. you got Brian Edwards, seven catches for 62 yards. Hayden Hurst, he was wide open in a couple spots. Still was missed. Still was missed by Jake Bentley a couple times, but he had seven catches for 93 yards. Brian Edwards added the touchdown. Ortre Smith continues to come on. Three catches for 36 yards. Shy Smith, I thought, I was waiting for Shy Smith to break out. Eventually got one catch, I believe, there in the second half, deep down the field, two catches for 28 yards. But right now, you've got to have somebody else step up. It's going to be easy to take away Hayden Hurst and Brian Edwards for opposing defenses down the road. You've got to have these other young receivers step up. Debo Samuel is not walking through that door. So you've got to have somebody else step up and become a weapon for this offense to give the defenses something else to defend. We're going to kick it out to Coach Will Muschamp, let you preview the upcoming SEC matchup against the Florida Gators. I uh, appreciate it. Got the Gators here. I uh, uh, appreciate it. Got the Gators here. Uh, at noon at Williams Bryce, we need to have an early crowd and a loud and proud crowd. Uh, I know our guys are excited for this next uh, three games at home and uh, looking forward to getting back to Williams Bryce. Um, obviously, Florida has been through a lot of adversity this year, uh, through some suspensions to start the year, some critical injuries that they've had throughout the year, and and obviously losing the head football coach. So. Uh, I know it's t probably taking its mental toll, but they still got a lot of good players and, and uh, some talented guys on the football team, some guys we're obviously we're very familiar with. And offensively, Malik Zire is a guy that uh, has played a lot of football at Notre Dame. He's got arm talent. He's a really good athlete. Uh, you know, got the start last week and certainly see him starting again this week. Felipe Franks is a young man that I know extremely well. He's got arm talent. He's uh, the touchdown pass against Tennessee. He's fallen back and throws it over 70 yards down the field. Uh, so he's a guy that's Got, got Sunday arm talent as far as those things are concerned. Really talented backs and Thompson and P. Ryan that run extremely hard. An offensive line that pushed us around last year. Same guys are back. Uh, that uh, A very talented, big, athletic offensive line. Really good skill people in Cleveland and uh, BP, Brandon Powell, and uh, uh, Josh Hammond and some guys outside, Freddie Swain. Uh, Dre Massey's a young man from the state of South Carolina that can really run in the tight end, Siante and uh, – Moral Stevens and DeAndre Goolsby are all back and all guys they utilize well in the passing game. So, you know, got some skilled guys offensively, defensively, just fast and athletic, jumps out at you. Taven Bryan, uh, the inside player they've got, is a very disruptive player, a guy that we've got to account for in the run game and the pass game and can be, he can wreck your day. I mean, he's a really good football player, probably played his final game inside against Texas A&M that I've seen in this league in a while. Uh, Duke Dawson's a guy on the back end that uh, plays extremely well, can play safety, corner, nickel, got man and zone instincts, makes a lot of plays on the ball. You know, dangerous guy there. And then you got two freshman corners playing really the high level, Marco uh, Wilson and C.J. Uh, Henderson. And I think C.J.'s got three or four interceptions on the year, and he's having a really good year for Chauncey Gardner and does a nice job. C.C. Jefferson, Zaninga's a guy on the edge. It's a, it is an issue you've got to count for in the pass rush. And, uh, Kerry Clark does a nice job inside, so they, they got a talented defense. They've had some really tough injuries on defense. You lose Marcel Harris before the year starts, and a leader for them, and an outstanding player, had an outstanding year a year ago. And then uh, and, uh, Nick Washington, they lost this year, is a leader for them as well as Jordan Sherrod, and also off a of defense that lost about seven guys drafted in the NFL. So 
So they've taken some, some hits there. Specialist, really good. Eddie Panero is a guy that's got a big leg. When they cross the 50, he's in range. He's kicked most of their kickoffs out of the end zone this year. And Johnny Townsend's averaging right at 50 yards a kick and a, a fantastic athlete in person. So uh, good people in the return game as well. So we've got to be able to cover down and spread the field and tackle in space and, and uh, against this team. And uh, Injury-wise for us, Taylor Stallworth right now to me would be the only person that I would say would be questionable. We did have some guys that didn't take many reps today or some at all, but we fully expect them to be back tomorrow, Thursday and Friday, and be ready for the game on Saturday. So Taylor's the only guy in my mind right now that would be questionable. I'll open up for any questions. Did you digest all that? Does it sound like Will Muschamp knows the defensive and offensive personnel for Florida? Does he sound like a guy who still kind of keeps an eye on how that team is performing? Again, he recruited many of those players there. He's very familiar with what they do well and the reasons for why he wanted them to be on the Gator football team. So he knows he knows what these guys are capable of. He, he knows what he saw in them as high school recruits, and he knows what they can do and what they have done in the SEC. So despite the fact that Florida is currently sitting – at three and five, three and four in the SEC, I don't think it's a stretch for for the Gators to come in to Williams Bryce Stadium and walk out with a victory on Saturday. Let's keep it going with the coach. I appreciate it. Got the Gators. We we coach front a little differently than a lot of teams do as far as how we play, and from a standpoint of. You know, understanding that what we call a twofer is taking two blocks is really important to keep our linebackers clean and free. Most of the teams that do play the run well, that's the way they play. And you watch Georgia and you watch Alabama and you watch Auburn the way they – that's the way we play. And uh, so those are, you know, those are things that sometimes take a little time for a guy to learn. We still want the guys to be vertical. We still want guys to be disruptive. Uh, but, you know, we also understand about playing blocks. And that's hard for young players especially – uh, to understand that part of it and to hang on to a block that eats two blocks that keeps a linebacker free, uh, to understand about the gap integrity that you got to be able to have defensively. And that's something that he's made tremendous strides with. And Talking about Javon Kinlaw. Anything, I was walking in the building with him this morning. He's right at 300. He's down about this when he stepped on campus. Uh, he's in better shape. He looked at me and said, I can play more than 45 snaps. And I said, well, we need you to especially if Taylor's not going to be able to go this week. So, uh, but I've been really proud of him and how he's approached things, his work ethic. He's just a, a delight to have around. Coach, you obviously recruited a lot of these guys yeah. and, and coached a lot of these guys. I'm wondering what kind of advantage that can give you going into a game like this, kind and of knowing there's It might be a disadvantage. I know they're pretty good. So, uh, <laughs> um, you know, Taven Bryan can, he can give you a, a bad day. He's a really good player in Duke Dawson. I mean, I know a lot of these guys. I don't know that you – I don't know there's an advantage or disadvantage in any of that. And uh, uh, they're all good young men. They're prideful guys. And, and uh, you know, we need to play extremely well Saturday. Will you know how good Florida can still be despite sure. what they've gone through? 18 to 22-year-olds might not see it the same way. Do you take steps this week to make sure they know how dangerous Florida can still be? No doubt. I talked to our guys Monday about, uh, you know, don't don't – don't be fooled by the tape from the last two weeks. Let's go back and watch Tennessee. Let's go back and watch LSU. Let's go back and watch A&M. Uh, let's, let's go back and watch those, those game tapes. They've had a lot of uncertainty off the field, and, and certainly it's, uh, you know, having been through it, it's a, it is a distraction, and it will take its mental toll on you. So, uh, you know, we, we need to – but, again, to, that's why the consistent message from, from me all the time is about our preparation and how we prepare – and how we go about our business and our preparation for the game is going to determine the outcome of the game, not about what the other team does. All right, so there's a little bit from Coach Will Muschamp. We'll react to that on the other side of this break right here on the Carolina Crow Line. You heard Muschamp right there just talk about the players he recruited. He knows what they're capable of. He knows why he wanted them in, in the Florida program. So he, he's very well versed in what the Florida defense is capable of. And while they haven't had success dropping their last four games, South Carolina, we know, they don't have the offensive talent just to roll their helmets out there and expect a victory here in the SEC. So we'll talk about that on the other side of this break. We're also asking Gamecock Nation, what do you think the final record for South Carolina is going to be in 2017? You're listening to the Carolina Crow Line. Blue Star Medicated Ointment gets five-star reviews from our loyal users for fast relief of the pain and itch of almost any skin irritation. Blue Star soothes insect bites and fungal infections. 
It really works on the summer rashes I get every year. I had psoriasis on my elbows. Blue Star worked wonders. Amazing stuff. Mirror bit on and the itch is gone. Look for the white box with the Blue Star in the first aid section. Feel Blue Star work fast or your money back. Computer, execute 12.4p operation. Optimizing algorithm. Running encryption packet alpha. Night, night. Oh, I don't feel so good. What? What is it, computer? Is it hot in here? It feels hot in here? I feel a little clammy. I should lie down or something. A computer with a virus? Surprising. What's not surprising? How much you could save by switching to GEICO. Those oysters Rockefeller were a mistake. GEICO. 15 minutes could save you 15% or more. I have to get to sleep. Tom had a stressful day, and now he can't shut down at bedtime. Need sleep. To fall asleep fast, millions of people turn to Unisom Sleep Gels. They're non-habit-forming and quickly help you sleep soundly so you wake recharged. Mm. Tom? <sighs> Unisom Sleep Gels. A stressful day deserves a restful night. Use as directed. Active ingredient diphenhydramine hydrochloride. My son had been injured and he was prescribed pain opiates. No one ever told us how highly addictive these drugs were. My reaction was shock. My son didn't get so deep into the dark, scary woods overnight and there's no straight line coming back. For parents out there who don't have hope, I realize there's a lot of families that are torn apart, but families can heal. Young people can get better. There's hope and help at drugfree.org. A message from Partnership for Drug-Free Kids. And we're back here on the Carolina Crow Line. Tyler at CRM Sports is the email address. If you want to get involved in the program, just shoot me an email, Tyler at CRMSports.com. Hit us up on Twitter at Carolina Crow Line. Like us on Facebook as well. Go ahead and get the Carolina Crow Line as a podcast. Just jump onto iTunes, hit subscribe, and you'll get the Crow Line every week when it becomes available. You can also stream the, str stream the show. Stream the show. Stream the show. You can stream the show, carolina.libsyn.com. That's carolina.libsyn, L-I-B-S-Y-N.com. You can also download the Gamecock Sports Radio app. You'll see the Carolina Crow line there during the middle of the week, and you will get all the other Gamecock and college football-related podcasts that are available and pushed out to the Gamecock Sports Radio app, courtesy of V Sporto. We're asking Gamecock Nation right now, what do you think – the final record for the South Carolina Gamecocks is going to be in 2017. Currently sitting 6-3, and 4-3 and three in the SEC with one SEC game remaining. Three games left on the schedule. Of course, Florida here at home, Wofford here at home, and Clemson here at home to wrap up the season. South Carolina, like I mentioned, 4-3 and three in the conference, sitting in a solid second place, one game ahead of the Kentucky Wildcats, who sit 3-3, three and three, and of course behind Georgia, who are 6-0 and oh in conference play. By the way, that figure could change now that Georgia is the number one ranked team in the college football playoff. Georgia going on the road, I believe. Let me check my master schedule here. Yes, Georgia going on the road to Jordan-Hare Stadium and take on Auburn. So now's your chance, Auburn. If you want to crawl into the, the outskirts of the college football playoff, talk sitting at five and one all you got to do is just knock off the number one rated Georgia Bulldogs there we'll see if that's something that can actually happen but the reason why I bring up the standings is because right now looking up and down you've got Vandy and Tennessee in the basement at 0 and 5 Missouri at 1 and 4 in league play Florida 3 and 4 you've got Kentucky like I just mentioned at 500 3 and 3 South Carolina has a chance to go 5 and 3 on the season and win five games in the league for the f for the first time in several years not to mention the opportunity to collect nine wins on the season, which I think at the beginning of the year, a lot of people would have been ecstatic with nine wins. I think you, even though you, the game resulted in a loss, when you look at the Georgia Bulldogs, I think you have to be a little comforted with how they were able to play and hang with the number one ranked team in the college football playoff for the majority of the football game on the road. 
And the reason why I think you have to have some good vibes about that is because you're going to be welcoming the defending national champion Clemson Tigers into williams Bryce Stadium three weeks from now. And if you can put a similar performance together, you've got to feel pretty good about pushing your win total to nine here in the regular season. So that's why I'm asking Gamecock fans right now, tweet to me, email me, hit me up on Facebook. You can jump into the uh, chat room on our Facebook Live broadcast as well. Tell us what you think the final record for South Carolina is going to be. Kirby Smart went on record after the football game saying he thought South Carolina was going to win out for the rest of the regular season. Now that could kind of just be coach speak or or two former teammates and friends. You know, he's kind of going to bat for Will Muschamp and, and trying to support him in, in, you know, any way he can without, you know, he's got that win in his back pocket. And so he tries to be a little bit complimentary after you just beat a team by two touchdowns. And he says, you know, he thinks South Carolina, South Carolina is going to win out. I'm not so sure about that, uh, but I think it's possible. I, I don't think – I wouldn't call it probable. So that's what I want to hear from Gamecock Nation. Do you think South Carolina – you go to a bowl game, you win your last three and win a bowl game, you're all of a sudden a 10-win team in Will Muschamp's second year. Now that might be a little wishful thinking a little bit further down the road with the garnet-colored glasses, but it's possible. You know, anything's possible at this point, I think. So the potential is there. That's the bottom line. The opportunity is there for that to happen. So let us know what you think is going to happen. You, Carolina could drop two of their last three. We know that is, is possible to happen as well because we know, being Gamecock fans, you guys know the kinds of crazy nonsense that Gamecock fandom is, just like you – beat number one Alabama in 2010 here at home, and then you go on the road and you let Randall Cobb run up and down the field all you on you in Lexington, Kentucky, and you immediately lose to a team that you had no business losing to the very next weekend. Those are the kinds of things I'm talking about uh, when I, I talk about growing up as a Gamecock fan. So let us know how you feel about the regular season record and what the potential is for this football team in Will Muschamp's second year. Because if you look at the schedule for next year – if you felt good about this year's schedule, you got to feel great about next year's schedule and the possibility for success going into 2018. By the way, speaking of 2018, we already know Bryson Allen Williams is out for the year, and he's already put out on social media that he's going to be returning for another year of football in a Carolina uniform next year. Debo Samuel just put out on social media right after the Georgia football game that he was actually running some routes out there at practice. Uh, and rumor was that he was supposed to actually return to practice this week in preparation for the Florida game. Probably wouldn't have played, but was going to return and, and get some practice time in. However, last week when he was running routes in the middle of his rehab, he re-injured the foot. I don't, know, I don't even know if it's the same leg that he injured against Kentucky. But um, anyway, it goes down officially as, I believe, a foot sprain. And so Muschamp updated um, his status and said he's, he's out. He's just out for the year. His, th this most recent injury is going to put him out for the year. However, Debo put out on social media that he's actually planning on returning uh, to South Carolina in 2018. A lot of people thought he was going to be someone who was going to declare for the draft. But at this point, what, I what is Debo Samuel going to be in the draft? after showing that he can't get through an entire season healthy since he stepped on campus. A fifth-round pick, sixth-round pick maybe. I think what he needs to do, and I think he knows this, and this is part of the reason why he decided what he did, he's got to show that he can get through a season healthy because teams aren't going to draft somebody who they don't think is ever going to play for them. So he needs to show that he can get through a season healthy. He can get through an entire slate of SEC play and contribute in the NFL. And if he can do that, then I think you're talking about somebody who could be a second-round draft pick in the NFL draft. N easy. I don't think it would be a problem with him. The dynamic playmaking that he showed just in the first three games of the season was off the charts. If we had Debo Samuel for the rest of the season, who knows where South Carolina would be sitting at this point. So it's nice to hear. The bottom line, good news, Debo Samuel is coming back for another year. Let's take a look at the SEC schedule before we get into the upcoming game against the Gators and a little bit of college basketball. 
Oof. Florida, 45 to 16 on the road in Columbia, Missouri to the to the Missouri Tigers, dropping an ugly game in Randy Randy Shannon's first game as interim head coach. Again, Malik Zaire got the start there. Um, just they just couldn't get anything going against a Missouri defense that at this point really isn't anything particularly special. Um, it was just a debacle in, in Columbia, Missouri. So the Gators, again, dropped their fourth game in a row. Kentucky drops another one, 37-34 at Lexington, Kentucky, to the Ole Miss Rebels. Southern Miss gets smacked around a little bit by Tennessee. They get one in the win column, 24-10. to Western Kentucky can't keep up with Vanderbilt. Vanderbilt gets a win, 31-17. Alabama, just too much overall for LSU. They win 24 to 10. Coastal Carolina. Coastal Carolina. That's right. Little Coastal Carolina almost knocks off the Arkansas Razorbacks. Arkansas wins at home 39 38 against a bad coast. They're not even a good Coastal Carolina team. They're a bad Coastal Carolina team. And it took a one point victory for Arkansas to pull it out at home. Auburn, 42-27 all over Texas A&M. It looks like that's pretty much going to be the end for Kevin Sumlin. If you're keeping up with the rumors, it seems like he's going to be the asked to step down at the end of the season. Mississippi State wins 34-23 over UMass. Your upcoming games of the week, of course, Georgia going on the road to Jordan-Hare Stadium to take on Auburn. That's going to be your national CBS 330 game. And Kentucky going to Nashville to play Vanderbilt. Missouri welcoming Tennessee at home. Of course, we know the Gamecocks are playing on national television on CBS at noon against Florida, the Florida Gators. Of course, that's going to be a 12.09 kick time. Don't let that fool you. If you're getting a little bit late to the stadium, you still got time to get into your seat. Alabama going out to Starkville to play the Bulldogs. Arkansas going on the road uh, to Baton Rouge to play LSU. Old Miss welcomes Louisiana Lafayette. And Texas A&M is going to try to get back to their winning ways against the New Mexico State Bulldogs. We're going to head out to our next break. When we come back, we're talking college basketball. Stay with us. It's almost time for the Gamecocks to tip off in 2017. All right, we're back here on the Carolina Crow Line. I'm Tyler Garrett, your host of the show, coming to you from the CRM Sports Studios in Columbia, South Carolina. The Gamecocks had their hoops for hurricane relief the Sunday after the Georgia football game against Virginia Tech here at the Colonial Life Arena and actually lost that game 86-67 to versus Bud Williams and the Hokies. And this was a game where it mirrored the, the exhibition game against Erskine in a couple of ways. Number one, there were a lot of abnormal lineups that were put out on the floor by Frank Martin. He went on to say after the Erskine exhibition game that he's just throwing combinations together. He's just trying to see what works still. He's not even set on who his starting five is going to be. So you saw a lot of an unusual mix of lineups in this football, or excuse me, basketball game because he's just letting the guys play. He's just trying to get these new guys as much experience and, and as many minutes on the court as he possibly can. When you factor in the fact that Corey Holden did not play in this basketball game, when you look at the stat sheet and 
uh, Silva and Coatsart only played 23 minutes combined, spent the majority of the game sitting on the bench. This was a game where you were just kind of experimenting. You were just kind of trying new things. This wasn't going to be one that was going to count, of course, it being an exhibition. So you're just trying to throw things together, throw things up against the wall, if you will, and see if they stick. And it didn't work for South Carolina. Going into the final eight minutes, Virginia uh, Tech had a 10-point lead. They were able to stretch that to a 19-point lead. And, and South Carolina really had no answer. This was a foul fest, I guess is, is one way to put it. A lot of trips to the line for Virginia Tech. South Carolina didn't even get that many trips to the line. I believe they t took eight trips to the foul line. And South Carolina shooting 21% from three-point land, 33 three-pointers. That's right, 33 three-point attempts in this basketball game, only making seven of those for 21% from the – from distance, only 35% from the floor. All this, and Frank Martin, when he previewed the regular season, talked about how this is probably one of his best shooting teams that he's had since he's been here at South Carolina. At this point in these two exhibition games, this basketball team has not shown that they can shoot the basketball very well. Again, grain of salt. These are two exhibition games. Frank Martin is still trying to find combinations of the lineups that work. The, the team is still trying to come together. You lose four critical pieces to the Final Four run last year in Dwayne Notis, Rakim Felder, Sindarius Thornwell, P.J. Dozier. I mean, that, that was basically the backbone and the brain and the heart of – your lineup last year. So it's going to take a lot for this team to come together and turn into a different version of the South Carolina Gamecocks. You've got a lot of new faces. As a matter of fact, you probably have, I know you're going to have at least three new starters in your starting five, and almost everybody coming off the bench is going to be a new face. And the people that were on the team last year that you're going to see are people that didn't even get very many minutes last year. I'm talking about guys like Kadeem Gee, who might have, I think he was averaging like two minutes a game by the time the end of the regular season rolled around. He's going to be expected to step up, but then you have so many new faces that you're trying to integrate into this offense and turn them into the, the I'll put up my air quotes, the Frank Martin type of basketball player that he wants here at South Carolina, the tough, gritty, defending, rebounding basketball team. This team, if they cannot get their shooting problems fixed, this is going to have to be an inside-out team. You're going to have to feed the ball into the elbow, into the post, along the wing. You're going to have to get touches for Silva. You're going to have to get touches for Kotsar. The ball, the offense is going to have to go through these guys in order to loosen up the defense and try and get shots for the guards to be successful, these good wide-open looks. And this is going to be a smaller lineup than what we were used to seeing last year. So these guys are going to play a little bit faster, would be my guess, try to get out a little bit more in transition and, and create some mismatch opportunities and some runouts and fast breaks because if they cannot shoot the ball, they're going to have to manufacture offense in another way. And, and that's going through Chris Silva and Mike Coatsar and then trying to get mismatch opportunities and getting the ball – close to the basket. That was the bread and butter of South Carolina last year. They had the size to drive the basketball and to either convert or to draw contact and get to the line. And you saw that, especially during South Carolina's run in the NCAA tournament. Time and time again, they were able to score the basketball or get to the line and stay in basketball games that way. And once that defense started to collapse, that's when they would find the open man out on the perimeter and they would just become an even more dangerous team. So right now, this is still a very much a work in progress for the Gamecocks. By the way, the banners will be raised. The men will raise their Final Four banner November 13th, their home opener against Western Michigan. And the women will raise their national championship banner November 10th during their home opener versus Alabama State in the Colonial Life Arena. So if you want to see your Gamecocks raise a Final Four and national championship banner in the Colonial Life Arena November 10th and 13th, that's going to be the week to do it. We'll be right back. Stay with us. Check out the Groupon app where you can save up to infinity, theoretically speaking. Actually, you can save up to $100 a week on what you do every day. Suppose you saved $10 on tacos and took that $10 and used it to get more great restaurant deals on Groupon, like Italian or Chinese. Pretty soon, you could save a ton. Brunch? Check Groupon. Dinner plans? Check Groupon. 
Hungry? Use the Top Rated Groupon app to save up to $100 a week on what you do every day. Download the app and save. Groupon. What makes a holiday card unforgettable? Personality. And no one makes it easier or more affordable to create a holiday card full of personality than Vistaprint. Right now, get 50% off all custom holiday cards. That means 30 cards start at less than $15. With hundreds of stunning designs, your personality will shine through with every card you send. Just go to Vistaprint.com today and enter the promo code HOLIDAY to get 50% off all custom holiday cards. That's Vistaprint.com, promo code HOLIDAY. Men, if you're like me, you appreciate the feeling of a clean, smooth shave from a quality blade. The sort of shave that cuts clean without the burn. So why are you messing around with generic razors that cost 32 bucks for an 8-pack when you can shave with Harry's high-quality German-engineered blades for half the price? And because Harry's is so confident in the quality of their blades, they'll send you their most popular set, complete with a razor, one of their world-famous blades, shaving cream, and post-shave balm for free if you cover shipping. A total value of $20 at no cost to you, with code 0404 at checkout, their way of saying thank you for trying them. How is Harry's able to save you all this money and still give you the best shave you'll ever enjoy? By owning the factory that manufactures the blades. That's how. Go to harrys.com now and enter code 0404 at checkout. To claim your free trial set and post-shave balm, that's harrys.com, code 0404. All right, we're back here on the final segment of the program. You're listening to the Carolina Crow Line. Here on the CRM Sports Network, I'm your host of the show, Tyler Garrett. We call this a two-minute drill because it's the final segment of the program. This is where I kind of just go through the upcoming matchup for the Gamecocks as they welcome the Florida Gators to town in what is the final SEC tilt of the season. South Carolina currently sits at a seven-point favorite. It started out as many as nine, but that spread has come down to seven points. Still a touchdown favorite over a, a Florida Gator team coming off back-to-back -back SEC East appearances in Atlanta. But this is a team right now at this point. Look, this team is a mess. This team is a mess for a lot of reasons. You're, you're missing a lot of your playmakers from early that early in the season, credit card fraud, scandal, whatever words you want to use for it. You're missing your best players from that situation. Your head football coach has already been fired after, I, I guess, faking – death threats or not really being forthcoming about the death threats that he alluded to in one of his in one of his post game press conferences. So he's gone. Right now, Randy Shannon is taking over and he's just a stopgap lame duck coach at the moment because he's not going to be returning at the end of this season. He knows that and the players know that as well. I've heard I've seen articles about there being a, a division within the locker room between who should start at quarterback, Malik Zaire or Felipe Franks, um, and Felipe Franks making comments about how he be, feels he's better than Malik Zaire. And, you know, I credit him for having the confidence to think that, but that's not something you really come out and publicly state when you're talking about trying to have a cohesive unit here trying to win football games. So a lot of stuff is being go, is going on down in Gainesville. The football team is being pulled in a lot of different directions. But make no mistake about it, this team still has a lot of talent, especially defensively, and they have a lot of talent at running back. They are averaging 161 yards on the ground compared to uh, South Carolina's 114. S both teams average right around 380 yards total offense excuse me, or excuse me, yards allowed. So defensively, they're, they're comparable in what they do, but when you insert Malik Zaire into the football game, now you're dealing with a running quarterback, and South Carolina has not done well with running quarterbacks. We've seen it this year with uh, Steven Johnson. We've seen it with Kellen Mond in the true freshman. We've seen it before with people uh, like Joshua Dobbs. We've seen it with people, uh, quarterbacks like Deshaun Watson. So running quarterbacks do not get handled very well by South Carolina. And this guy is not the fastest. 
He's not a Cam Newton, but he is going to try and stretch the field with his legs. And he can't. Malik Zaire has the capability to do that. And he can also make all the throws. So this is going to be a guy that South Carolina is really going to have to be careful with. And that's going to be my number one key to this game. South Carolina, no secret. In the SEC, you have to stop the run game. And in this particular matchup, that's going to include the quarterback run. So it's going to be particularly important for South Carolina to make sure they stay gap sound. They play gap sound defense. The backside defenders are responsible for setting the edge, not to allow any cutback moves or any zone read quarterback keeps that allow them to get out to the outside of the football field where they can create those one-on-one -on -one opportunities to, to extend plays. That's going to that's gonna be my number one key to the football game. And my other key is going to be for South Carolina to run the football. South Carolina came off their best running performance against Vanderbilt. They immediately followed that up with their worst running performance against the Bulldogs. So I need to see creativity in the run game. I need to see productivity in the run game. These are the two things that it's going to take for South Carolina to win this football game. And the other part is you can't get complacent. You can't think that you're just going to show up and by virtue of the fact that you're playing in williams Bryce Stadium, you're going to be able to win this football game. We saw that South Carolina can't do that against a team like Kentucky earlier in the season when they lost 23-13. to you have to continue to put the pedal to the metal. You have to continue to protect the football and stay mentally in the game and stay mentally sharp so that you don't let the, you don't let the Florida Gators think for one minute that they have a shot in this football game. So those are, those are my three keys to the football game. Overall, I think South Carolina is going to be able to win this one. Um, I, I'm going to say it's probably going to be something around a 28-21 type of situation for the Gamecocks and the Florida Gators, and I think South Carolina gets their seventh win on the season and their fifth win in SEC play. But go ahead and tweet to me real quick before the end of the program. Let me know what you think the final record is going to be for the Gamecocks. It's at Carolina Crow Line. You can also email the show, Tyler at CRMSports.com. You can still jump into the chat room on our Facebook Live. You can continue to comment throughout the week on any news that breaks or any thoughts that pop into your head that you want to share and make yourself a part of the conversation. We can keep that going all week long. So overall, I think in South Carolina's final SEC game, if they can stop the quarterback run and the running game, if they can establish the run, keep Jake Bentley clean, and take care of the football, I think South Carolina is going to have a lot of success here. So I'm going to predict somewhere right along. I'm, I'm going with Vegas on this one. I think it's going to be somewhere in the, in the neighborhood of a 31-21, 28-21 type of football game. I've got Salah in the chat room right now on Facebook Live. He says it's going to be 34-17. So go ahead and take Salah's prediction and, and place your wagers. If you were smart, you would take my prediction and place your wagers because you know that's actually going to be the right prediction between the two of us. That is going to be the program for this week. By the way, regular season for basketball gets started Friday, November 10th, as the Gamecocks go on the road to take on the Wofford Terriers up in the upstate. So that's going to be your kickoff to the regular season on November 10th. That's right around the corner. And it's going to be basketball season. I can't believe it. I'm really looking forward to it. I think South Carolina is going to have be pleasantly surprised, the Gamecock Nation, that is, with the basketball team in 2017. I'm expecting another push for the NCAA tournament. That's the program. I'm your host of the show. We'll see you back next week right here on the Carolina Crow Line.